In 1946, the Americans ended the nuclear partnership with Britain. Senator Brian McMahon's legislation made it a capital offence to reveal nuclear secrets, even to their former allies. It was a devastating rebuff for the new government of Prime Minister Clement Attlee. Well, it was a terrific blow, and Attlee did everything he could to try and get the thing back on track. That October, in a secret cabinet committee, Attlee listened to his colleagues argue over Britain's bomb. There is an enormous anxiety, I think, in the political class uh, in, in Britain at this particular time, um, that in order to retain our position for as long as we possibly can, then uh, we have to develop these weapons uh, ourselves. Two ministers, Stafford Cripps and Hugh Dalton, were close to persuading Attlee that Britain could not compete with the Americans. But then the Foreign Secretary, Ernest Bevan, arrived, still bristling over a conversation he'd had with the American Secretary of State. Bevin turned up and said, no, Prime Minister, that won't do at all. We've got to have this. And uh, one of the reasons he gave was a very striking one, uh, quite bluntly. He said, I don't mind for myself, but I don't want any other foreign secretary of this country to be talked at by a secretary of state in the United States, as I have just had. We've got to have this thing over here, whatever it costs, and we've got to have a bloody Union Jack flying on top of it. Attlee was persuaded. Britain must have its own bomb, not just for deterrence, but, he believed, to persuade America that Britain was its natural nuclear ally. If you're in a nuclear relationship with them, it's a bond. It sets you apart from all the other countries in the world. You're the, 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 the family member. And that's terribly important to Britain as a, as a, as a world uh, power in decline. Attlee turned to the one man he knew was capable of building a bomb. He'd worked closely with the Americans at Los Alamos and helped design the bombs that would be dropped on Japan. His name was William Penny. Look out in the background. The thing we particularly would like to know is how you personally feel about the work that you do. Well, I think it's got to be done. Penny was a most interesting guy. He'd come from very ordinary beginnings, he was self-made, and he had a funny little drawl. And he looked and spoke as though he was a bit simple, quite honestly, because he had a brain like a razor. A brilliant mathematician, and we were so lucky to have him. And what are your plans now, sir? Well, I have to send in my report to the government. When I've done that, I shall have a short holiday and I hope to play some golf. Yes, King golf? Yes, King golf. And thank you very much for talking to us. Penny faced a choice. Return to quiet academia or agree to Attlee's request to build Britain's first atom bomb. He had a, a, a wonderful offer of being principal, I think, of an Oxford college. But I think the politicians persuaded my father that Britain should have a nuclear deterrent, and he was persuaded that it was his duty to take on this awful job, really. Penny's nuclear achievements had been made in collaboration with American scientists, but now he was on his own. If we were going to do it, we had to repeat work which they'd already done, because not published, uh, at enormous cost. And of course, cost us a lot in time. We were way behind the Americans in producing atomic weapons. But Attlee had faith in his scientists. British science was extraordinary. We'd invented radar, we were, we'd split the atom, we invented the jet engine, uh, we had an extraordinary impact. I mean, considering the size of, of the British scientific community compared to uh, the American scientific community, um, the flourishing that had taken off in World War II and subsequently was remarkable. Penny could at least rely on John Cockcroft, one of the pioneers of nuclear science. 
Cockcroft was appointed to run Harwell, the new atomic research establishment charged with reproducing the nuclear science the Americans already had. With Cockcroft at Harwell, Penny could set up Aldermaston, where the bomb would be made. That left the most difficult task, creating the vital ingredient for the bomb, plutonium. It meant building Britain's first nuclear reactor. It was a huge task, and it went to Britain's best engineer, Christopher Hinton. Hinton was enormously impressive. You were aware when he came into the room that here was a very, very imposing person. He was uh, well over six feet, six foot two or three, a very keen face and piercing blue eyes. And he was very much the leader, the boss, the planner, the chap who knew what to do. They were nicknamed the Bold Bad Barons. Penny, Cockcroft and Hinton would mastermind Britain's atomic project. They were arch meritocrats. They certainly had no element of privilege in their background. Um, and uh, there was a lot of that about in the post-war years. I think they would have conformed to what C.P. Snow called uh, the new men, the, 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 this ideal of, of uh, uh, people who make their own way and contribute on the basis of their, of their talents um, without class paying a part. And so it was that Windscale, a small peninsula of land next door to the town of Seascale, became the home to Britain's first nuclear reactor. The area had enjoyed brief popularity as a Victorian seaside resort, but by the late 1940s, its main industry was in decline. Well, as with all mining areas, there's been a history of major accidents, and one of the major pit losses here was 104 people killed. It had also been a very depressed area before the war. It suffered massively during the Depression. And so it was an area where people, uh, even though they may have had some questions in the back of their minds, certainly would have seen this as a, as a bright new future and going into a very clean and infinitely much safer industry. And so that's why so many people welcomed it. To build Windscale, Hinton needed the cutting-edge nuclear science to come from Harwell. To Harwell come students from all parts of the Commonwealth and the British Isles to learn something of the power plants of the atomic age. The challenge the researchers at Harwell faced was to design a reactor at Windscale which would produce enough plutonium for the bomb. When pieces of uranium are brought together, a chain reaction occurs. Neutrons released by the uranium collide with neutrons from its neighbours, releasing even more neutrons. This chain reaction converts some of the uranium into plutonium. But the chain reaction makes uranium ferociously hot. Left unchecked, the reaction could go out of control, like a bomb. The British scientists knew the Americans controlled the chain reaction by placing the uranium in hundreds of channels, drilled through a block of pure graphite, known as the core. The uranium becomes dangerously hot, so to prevent it from catching fire, the uranium was placed in aluminium cartridges which sealed it off from the air. Once the plutonium had been produced, the hot cartridges were then pushed out of the back of the core into cooling ponds of water, so the precious plutonium could be extracted. But the most dangerous part of the process was while the cartridges were still inside the graphite core. Unless they were constantly cooled, they could melt the core or set it on fire. The British knew that the Americans had prevented this in their reactor at Hanford, by pouring a constant stream of water through the channels. But this system had a serious weakness. If the water supply failed, the core itself could explode. <laughs> 